do that. All right, praise God. We're going to be starting off in Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to go to verse 34. But before we go there, or as you're going there, uh, last week, um, probably, I don't even remember what day it was, but I was praying somewhere right around there by that little refrigerator, and the Lord gave me uh, one of those glimpses of a vision again. And, you know, I know that I had a conversation about with someone recently about this, but I wasn't thinking no more about that conversation when all of of a sudden, this vision just intruded upon my in my spirit uh, spiritual eyes, and it was a double edged sword, and it just it just came in like that, and then immediately the scripture followed, which was Matthew chapter ten verses thirty four through thirty nine, and we're going to go ahead and read these this scripture. It says, "Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword." For I have come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, I pray that you would help me this morning, Lord, to speak forth the truth that is in this message, Lord God, that you have laid upon my heart. Lord, I know that I prayed over this message, Lord God, and I know that my only desire is that the truth of your word and the love of your heart, Lord God, would be revealed to your people, Lord God, that, that you would communicate to us, Lord, how you really feel, Lord, your mind, Lord God, that you have laid out for us in the scripture, Lord. I pray that you would reveal, Lord God, the truth through the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you cause our hearts and our minds to come alive. Lord God, I pray that you would remove me from the equation, oh Lord God. I pray, Lord, that I would only be a vessel, Lord, that you would speak through. Lord God, that it would be your Holy Spirit speaking, oh Lord God. I yield my tongue to you and pray that you would speak forth your truth in the name of Jesus. And so, so this double-edged sword kind of comes in with this scripture and it's talking about dividing and it's talking about dividing those really that are going to believe and trust in the Lord versus those who don't really want to have anything to do with the Lord. Now, there's always good news and there's always hope because even though it's talking about family members here, God's hand is moved through the prayers of the saints. I want to encourage you that. You, listen, we can't sit back as armchair quarterbacks and we can't sit back on the couch flipping through the channels whenever we have loved ones. And I'm preaching to the preacher. Listen, when we have loved ones that are going through things and are not receiving the truth of the gospel at this point in time, we have to partner with the Holy Spirit. We have to be Begin to cry out to God and ask God to move by the power of his Holy Spirit that he would move on our behalf, that he would move on their behalf, and that he would do a work on the inside of God has a way of getting a hold of us. Amen. And I've seen these things happen in my own life. I'm not just speaking about what I've seen happen in other people's lives. I'm speaking about what I've seen happen in my own life. So he said, I come not to bring peace. You know, a lot of times people, they, got the, they have the wrong image of Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And, and one day there's going to be physical, literal peace on the earth in the millennial reign of Christ because the spirit of Antichrist is going to be done away with and it's going to be the spirit of the Christ and there's going to be nothing but peace according to Isaiah chapter 11 and it talks about the fact that a wolf and a lamb are going to be able to lie together and that a lion will eat straw like an ox and that a child would able to be able to put their hand on, on a serpent's hole and not even be hurt because see the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth and the spirit Spirit of God is going to be it is going to be the prevalent spirit upon the earth and on the inside of, of people's lives. But right now, that's you. If you're a born again Christian this morning, I don't. It doesn't matter where you've been. My question is, have you been born again? See, because if you're a born again Christian, that glory, that hope, that spirit is resident on the inside of you right now, and that's the thing that we're talking about this morning. That's the separating 
factor. That's what makes God's people different than the people of the world. We need to understand that because sometimes as God's people, if we're not careful, we can become kind of high and mighty. And we can become, uh, think more highly of ourselves than what we bought to. And I know that I'm probably the only one that's ever dealt with that kind of problem in this place. But, but the reality of it is, is that a lot of times, we're, if we're not careful, we'll allow this religious spirit to grab a hold of us. And we begin to look down and condescendingly on people. And that's not God's will. But nevertheless, with that said, he, he comes to bring a sword. And, and there's going to be... People that will receive the truth of the gospel. And there's there's going to be people that are going to reject the truth of the gospel. And that sword is the dividing line that shows the difference between the two. He says that you're not worthy of me if you allow your mother or your father to prevent you from following after me. Now, each one of us have to determine in our hearts and minds how we define that, what that means in our personal lives. I mean, I know it, I know it, to me it's real simple. To me it's real simple that there's many times there could be family members that are trying to, trying to pull me away from giving in completely and totally over to God. Sometimes people are okay if we give, if we give God a little bit. You understand what I'm getting at? They're okay if we give a little bit. We dip our toe in, into the into the gospel world, into the kingdom world. They're okay with that. They kind of sometimes people in the world want us to be lukewarm. No, really, I'm going to be real with you. Many times people don't want us. But Jesus said, "I wish that you were either hot or cold." But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. The Lord wants us to be hot for him. That's his will. But if we're not going to be hot for him and instead we're going to be lukewarm, he'd rather just be cold and just zip the lip. <laughs> He's told me that before. He said, son, I wish you'd just be quiet. Because, see, sometimes you're over here talking about me, but the way that you're living your life is not a reflection of what I really am. And so you end up causing more damage and heartache to my, my kingdom. So at times like that, maybe it'd be best if you kind of just kept quiet. And, and many times that's how, but look, the Lord wants us to be hot for him. And he wants us, he says it, he says, he, this is the words of Jesus. He that takes not his cross. It's talking about the fact that, look, Jesus' cross crucified him, right? Jesus' cross put him to death. And he's saying, now you have to take your cross. Yes, I heard Bob Cornell say it. It was the most beautiful revelation, however many years ago it was. Then when he said, his cross is your cross. And that is true. His cross is your cross. But at the same time, you got to let that cross work on you. You got to let the, the work of the cross have its way in you. Your mindsets, your attitudes, your own personal preferences. If it's contrary to the will of God and the word of God, you have to let the cross have its way in you. You have, if you demand to save your own life, the, the, the Lord said you'll lose your life. Now, I mean, do, look, do we need to, do we need to get kind of like specific? I don't have anything in my notes, but you think, let, I'm not even going to say it. Let's let the Holy Spirit do it. But I will provoke your thoughts. Think in your heart and in your mind, Wherever it is that you live in the world, in the workplace, sometimes you got to work with people that are that don't know Jesus, right? At school, right? You go to school with people that don't know Jesus. You have family members, right? You might go eat supper with somebody or a family get together, right? That don't know Jesus, okay? And so my question is this, is that what is it about those, or even in your daily lives, how is it that you can allow the world in and you can see the world and the difference between the world and the word? Does that make sense? Does anybody in here know the Bible well enough to now you can start to recognize the difference between the world and the word? Sometimes we don't. And it's a and I don't say that to be ugly, but sometimes we don't understand the word well enough to even know the difference. And so what we do, and here I am, I guess I'm gonna get a little bit messy. Here we we scroll through and we see the you know whatever's on, on Facebook or on social media and people posting scriptures about various things having to do with the Lord, but then we see the actions of the of their next post and how they're not even like and it's just like it's just pure worldliness. And, and then we, we imagine in our mind that that's normal Christianity. 
That it's normal Christianity to post scripture, to talk about scripture, to say that we love God. But then the next post is something that's complete worldliness. And we see that also in the people that we work with and, 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 and the people that we engage with in daily living. And that's really what part, this is really the emphasis of this message is that, no, there is a dividing line between the, the people of God and it's spoken of through the word of God. And, and, you know, I want you to know that God has always required that his people be separate. This isn't something new. Is it, but, but what the world wants us to do, it wants us to be convinced that what it says is okay. And, that, and, and come against the word of God. See, the word of God says this in Romans chapter 2. It says, he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. See, in the Old Testament, God's people were separate from the world around them. God, God commanded Abraham before the law even was. You see, God promised the new covenant to Abraham before the law even was. And God said, the men in your camp are going to have to be circumcised. You're going to circumcise them on the eighth day. It showed a separation. It showed a difference between the world around them. And there's, there's, listen, there's theological truth in that. I mean, I'm not trying to get overly weird about it, but the cutting away of flesh, the shedding of blood is interconnected to all of that. That's a type of the cross. That's a type of the work of the cross. But what we're told in the New Testament is this, is that, that a true Jew or a believer or a person that belongs to God, that a true circumcision is something that takes place in the heart and on the inner man. And, and so when a person receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit moves in, the Holy Spirit through the word of God begins to do work on the heart, begins to carve away, begins to circumcise, begins to perform a surgical procedure that whittles away the things of the fall, whittles away the things of the world. But it requires you and I to cooperate with the truth of God's word and not to continue to embrace the things that we desire. We have to let the cross have its way yes. in our life. Amen. Amen. Now, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness? Now, now listen, if we, if we read the whole chapter or if we really got into the story and we might continue this on Wednesday night, uh, but, but what I want what I want to say is this, is this, he says, he goes on to say that if you have, a, and he just uses fornication as the example, okay? I'm not picking on fornication, but it's been prevalent. I know I've been saying it a lot lately, but I'm not doing that on purpose. It's just the text that the Lord keeps bringing me back to, all right? And, and, and so he's saying if you have a fornicator in your midst, so this is a person that is actually living a life of fornication and is not really ashamed of it. There's a, you know, there's a difference, I believe, at least in my, it's neither one of them's good, but, but many times we have sin that's hidden in our lives, right? Yeah. And, and it's, and you know, to me, it's kind of like a good symptom when somebody's ashamed of their sin. Yeah. I mean, it's not good to keep hiding it. Like we want to expose it. We want to let the Holy Spirit have it, but it's kind of a, a good sign when we're a little bit ashamed of it, right? That like we're just not living it all out and open and flamboyant, right? We, we really need to, we need to let it be released and we need to let it be released in the presence of the Lord. But what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes people just live in, in the midst of sin and they don't even mind telling you about it. And that's, and, but, but this is the thing. He says, but if he calls himself a brother, he says, if he calls himself a brother and he's living that way, then you know what you need to do? Don't eat with him. No, not eat, he says. Don't do it. Don't fellowship with a person that's living knee deep in sin and is all, uh, all uh, uh, allowed about it and doesn't have a contrite heart about it and isn't soft towards the, the, the Lord about it. And listen, he says, don't do it. Now, he, he doesn't tell us to completely disconnect with people that are in the world. That are doing that extortioners, those that are covetous, those that are greedy, those that are living in fornication. He said, "Because if I told you to do that, you'd have to like, I'd have to actually take you out of the world." Right. 
And that's not God's will for the life of the believer because, see, we're supposed to be salt in the earth. We're supposed to be the light of the world because the light of God has been transferred into us and the spirit of God lives in us. Amen. So he doesn't want to take us out of the world. That wasn't his prayer. His prayer was that he, he would we would be left in the world and that and that through us and the light that shines, that God's glory would be revealed. And that also he said that his prayer was that the father would keep us, the disciples, you. He said that he said, I'm not just praying for the disciples that followed him, but for those that would believe on me. Because of their testimony that you, that you and I, amen, that we would be kept from the evil one, that he would keep us from the, from evil, that we wouldn't be swallowed up in this evil age, the works of this evil age, right? And he goes on to say this. He says, uh, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I mean, this is the, still the letter to the Corinthians. It's in chapter 1 Corinthians 6. And he says, he says, come out from among them. So there's a separation that must take place between the people of God and the people of the world. It's very important that we understand that. It's very important that young people understand that. That there has to be a separation between the things of God and the people of God and the people of the world. See, under Levitical law, what is Levitical law? The book of Leviticus, where the priests taught the people of God ceremonial purity. They couldn't eat certain foods, right? The big one that we remember is the pigs, right? You can't eat pork mm -hmm. uh, because it was considered an unclean animal. You know, a pig will eat just about anything, right? I mean, you throw something in that pig slop and that pig is going to eat it. And, and you know, in the Old Testament, they weren't to eat because they're because they were unclean, and they're eat, they'll eat just about anything. But do you know that spiritually speaking, that that he says, "Touch not the unclean thing, and I <clears throat> I will receive you." <clears throat> that there's an uncleanliness in the New Testament or the New Covenant, where if you and I aren't careful, and we find ourselves in the company of those that are unclean, like to the point where he look what he said though he said. He said, what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? What communion does light have with darkness? And listen, the word communion is interconnected to the word participation. Mm, that's good. I want you to know that this morning, that God is not okay with us being in participation with the people of the world and engaging with them. In the things that they do. This is what the scripture says. It doesn't say that we're never going to sit down at a table with them. It doesn't say that there will never be any conversation or business dealings with the world. That's not what it's saying. But it's saying that we are not to participate with them in their uncleanliness. And listen to me. You got to understand that the people of the world eat just about anything. Just like, a, just like the swine, the people of the world will eat just about anything. And they will call it. God. Yep. And now they're they're cloaking or clothing themselves in Christian garment, but but the things that they're saying and the way that they're living are not lining up. And I'm here to tell you, I am not the Holy Spirit. I know you know that. You're not the Holy Spirit. I hope you know that. And it's not our job to judge, but we can judge the fruit based upon what's coming up on the tree. And, and, and this is really not a word that says that because someone sometimes has bad fruit that they're automatically not a real tree. That's not even what I'm saying because we're all in a process where we're being changed from glory to glory. Amen. Being conformed into the image of his dear son. Amen. And we're to yield to that and allow that. So there's, there's scriptures that we're all familiar with regarding the word of God as a sword. Ephesians 6, 17. Uh, talking about the armor of God says and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. And I'm just I'm just sticking with this sword concept because I saw this sword and the Lord said that the sword of the Lord, it's, it's a it's a dividing sword, but it's not just dividing and we'll get into that. It's also it's also got healing with it. Amen. All right. So he says he says 
take the sword of the spirit. You know, this kind of hit me at another level. I don't know that I ever saw it in, in like the spirit has a sword. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has a sword. That's what that's what it says. It's capitalized. I mean, not that I not that I give everything over to the translators. They're smarter than me, but they do to capitalize that because it's not talking about your spirit. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a sword. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to, to come in and to do His work. To bring division, to bring separation, but to also bring revelation. Amen? He brings revelation. And so, so then in Hebrews, and we've talked about this passage recently, Hebrews 4 and 12, it says, For the Word of God is quick. That's old English for alive. So the word of God is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I mean, there's a lot that we've been taught. We've talked about this verse quite a few times over the last month or so. And, and we've really broken it down, soul, spirit, and things of that nature. But really, really the part that I want, I want to kind of hone in on this morning is that it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Because what I'm trying to say is this, is that if you will allow yourself to get along with the word of God and you will allow the sword, the spirit to wield his sword. Right. And you will allow the, you and the, you and the word will get alone and you'll allow the Holy Spirit to have his moment with you. What he'll do is he'll begin through the word of God to reveal to you your own intents and motives right, right. of your heart. Yes, See, well. sometimes we believe that the intents and motives of our heart are more spiritual than what they really are. Sometimes we believe ourselves and I'm speaking from experience. We, we, we believe ourselves to be more spiritual. We believe our actions to be more spiritual. We believe our reactions to be more spiritual than what they really are. Okay, but the Holy Spirit through the word, he has an amazing way of, of touching us in spots and in our heart and in our mind and revealing things to us that no man could at one moment with the Lord and his word, I'm telling you right now, will fix a whole lot of trouble. Amen. That we've gotten ourselves into. Amen. Yeah. So I want to encourage you with that. I want to encourage you to be people of the word. I want to be encourage you to be people of prayer. Amen. Yeah. But, but, you know, people have differing opinions about what the adjective two edged means. And I don't know that we can be completely certain in this. Some of this is going to be men's opinions, maybe men's speculation, because I've never found a specific scripture that that definitely delineates and defines it, right? But but it's an adjective that says that the sword, the word of God is like a two-edged sword, right? And and I do know this. I do know that the word of God is the sword, and I do know that the word of God is truth. And I do know this about the word of God, that on one side of it, it will bring conviction. <clears throat> when, and, and that's a good thing. See, see sometimes we're confused in the church the difference between conviction and condemnation. Right. And sometimes whenever, whenever the word of God is going forward. See, and the, 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 what a dangerous thing is that we can have the word of God and we'll be at home and we can be reading it. And then if we don't realize it, but we don't like something, it's easy just to close the book. Right. And sometimes, though, whenever a person's preaching and, and the Holy Spirit is moving, that it hits a spot in our heart. OK. And then and then we don't realize, but it makes us feel uncomfortable or however. The whole, that's actually a good thing. That means the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And people not saying y'all because, I mean, y'all keep coming back. So I don't believe that's your heart. But but there's a lot of times. That's why many times in some churches, preachers are apprehensive to let the word of God speak. Because when the word of God is really released. Uh, for the way that it's written, it will bring conviction yes. to the heart of people because the whole, and, but this is why the Holy Spirit loves us. The Holy Spirit loves us so much that he doesn't want us to, to think that we're okay when in reality we're not okay. He doesn't want us to wait and get to the end of the race and realize that we weren't even really running the right race. 
He wants to auto correct us as we're going along the journey. And the word of God is the very thing that can do that. So one edge of that sword brings conviction, but you know what? It also makes free. Because see, the sword of the spirit is the word of God and the word of God is the truth of God and the truth of God not only convicts, but it also will make free. But you got to you got to respond to it appropriately. The word of God has to be responded to appropriately. For those that respond to conviction by faith, it heals and sets free. For those who rebel against God's truth, though, it results in judgment and condemnation, right? I mean, have you ever seen that in your own life? We don't have to ask if you've seen it in other people's lives. My question is, have you seen it in your own life? I've been around on this planet long enough to see that there's been times I have rejected the word of God in certain areas. And the end result of that was not good for me. <laughs> it was not good for me. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting to the place where I'm starting to believe. Now, listen, the world's going to keep convincing you that this is just a book written by men. But I'm here to tell you right now, I'm, I don't believe that for even one second. I believe that I'm, I know. Oh, yeah, but you're the preacher. Yeah, yeah, I'm a preacher. But I'm telling you right now, I believe with all of my heart that that the word of God is the word of God, that it is alive and that if I will respond to it, that there's a blessing and there's healing waiting for me. And if I disregard it and reject it, that there's going to be darkness and that there's going to be heartache and there's going to be turmoil. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting tired of heartache and turmoil. Yeah. Yes. I will say this real quick. It doesn't have anything to do with my message. But Jesus said this. He said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, the girl that cuts my hair, she's doing real good. I know y'all don't know her, but <laughs> Danielle knows her. And, and she said, I just keep hearing, suffering is only momentary. Mm -hmm. Suffering is only temporary. And when she was saying that, it really resonated with my spirit. She says, I can't get away from it. It's like the spirit's knocking on my door and you're saying, it's only temporary. So whatever you have to face in your life, it can be temporary for this moment of time where you are and you're going through something in your life, right? And, 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 you're, and you're feeling the weight of it on you. I've got to tell you, like the psalm says, though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the night. Jesus. But even at the end, whatever that looks like, whatever you have to face that this life brings you in, please let me remind you that it's only temporary. Jesus suffered. He despised the shame but because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And I got to tell you something, Christian. I believe you're a Christian if you're in this place this morning. Either that or your parent drug you by the hair. <laughs> Probably not. Really. It looks like you all came of your own volition and your own free will. First time. But I want to tell you that just as Jesus endured, there's many times believers have to endure. Sometimes people, and this is completely off of the beaten path, but I feel led to go here for a second. Sometimes we quote only the first two thirds of the scripture. Yeah. They overcame him. Who? Who did they overcome? Who? The enemy? Yeah. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. And what's the third, the, the, the last third? Y'all know? We don't quote that one too much, huh? We don't like that part. What's that? They, love, they did not love their life unto death. They did not love their own lives even unto death. Now, you can take that spiritually for today and go back to the first passage of Scripture we read and say, pick up your cross, follow after him. He that desires to save his life. But, but really, that's the book of Revelation. And that's talking about somewhere, somehow, somebody. I don't know who, and I'm not trying to teach end time events. I'm just trying to make a point. Somewhere, somehow, somebody is going to have to not love their own life even unto death. Listen, even if, listen, i got to say something right now. That in this world and other places on this earth, people are having to live that passage of scripture. And I can't get it out of my heart that i got to tell people 
that if you're gonna, if we're gonna overcome, it's gonna be because we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and that we will not love our own lives even unto death. And I want to encourage you right here, right now, to learn how today to not love your own life even unto death. I want to encourage you right now, today, that not to love your friendships more than Jesus, not to love your desires more than Jesus, but to allow the Holy Spirit, the, the, sword, the Spirit sword of the Word of God to pierce, yes. to penetrate, to, to illuminate, and to bring revelation to your heart to show you the areas of your life, show the preacher, show Pastor Matt the areas of his life that are contrary to the will of God that I would allow the cross to be applied to that. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it convicts, but it also makes free. Listen, the sword of our Lord is going to judge the rebellious. It's important that we understand that. There's judgment today. Listen, the Apostle Paul even said this. He was talking about healing, but he said this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them which believe, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. Then he goes on to talk about this. He says, for men suppress the truth. He says that the wrath of God is being poured out upon the earth because men suppress the truth. Listen, you do not want to say, because see, that's a different kind of wrath. It's different than thumos wrath. There's two different words, at least two different words in the Greek for wrath. One is orge, the other is thumos. Thumos is a breathing slaughter of judgment. It's, it's, a, it's a passionate, glowing, righteous indignation and anger. See, there's an, there's an aspect of our God that we don't like to look at. There's a part to the nature of our God that we kind of like, we just, we just kind of like close it off and we just put it in the, on the back burner and we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. But I'm here to tell you that the word of God describes him as though he is, he is holy and he is righteous. And that he has a people that he has called to serve him. And that he has revealed his hope and his love and his word to them. And he desires, no, 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 he commands that they that they yield to him. That if they're going to be his people, that they separate themselves. And that they connect themselves to his word. And by his grace in the new covenant, hallelujah, he gives them strength to live for him. Help us, Lord. But there's a certain type of other wrath. And it's a slow, insidious progress. It's a spiraling down of the morality of humanity. It's like the frog in the, in the boiling pot right, right. situation. You ever heard of that? And so a frog is a reptile, right? And they're cold-blooded. And like you can put it in a pot and you can turn the fire on low. And it will just adapt to its climate. And that thing will be cooked and never even know that it was in a cooking pot. And that's kind of like what's been happening through the ages of the world that we're living in. Slowly but surely, it's been turning up the heat, turning up the heat, men suppressing the truth, turning up the heat, turning up the heat. The advent of the musical changes in the world, Hollywood changes in the world, social media changes in the world. And instead of going to the word of God, we believe what everybody else says is okay. We believe what the world says is okay. And slowly but surely, just been ramping up the heat and, the, and we're just like some little frogs getting cooked. And believing we're being inundated. If we allow ourselves to be inundated, you cannot even listen. I'm not telling you to take your TV outside and beat it up with a sledgehammer. I'm not telling you to take your computer and beat it up with a sledgehammer. That's not what I'm trying to tell you to do. But I'm trying to make a point. If we constantly allow ourselves to be fed, you don't even have to watch a movie nowadays because the commercials are filled with it. Yeah. Yeah. Filled with it. I don't even know the name of the medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Zim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 talking about Brelvi? Yeah. What, is that how you say it? Bell Bell is that the one for the like, HIV? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Bell. So the commercials, and I'm not picking on homosexuality. I'm just trying to make a point. And I, I said it a while back. I didn't even. I don't even know where I'm going. But look, like I, I said it a couple of weeks ago. But Lucy and Ricky in the Lucille Ball show slept in two different beds, and now we got commercials 
that people that are living a homosexual lifestyle can take a pill in advance so that they don't get HIV. And it's like, and, and, and the world is celebrating that. The world is celebrating that because they're like, people have a right to love. But that's not love. That is not love. And, that, and the people, anybody that watches this, not, not that there's that many people that watch it, but it had it go, it had it got outside of the realm of Christianity, I can promise you there'd be some haters that would be saying, you're a hater, preacher. You hate the lives of me. No, I'm not a hater. I'm a lover of the souls of men because my God says that there is a, there is a wrath that is spiraling society downward and people are getting caught up in the tornado activity of the lies of the world and they're getting caught up in the swirl of it. Lord, help us. And it starts to affect our mind and we start to believe what they're saying. And, and I've seen it even in people in my own family. At times, Lord, help us. He's going to judge. It says in Revelation 19 and 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he would smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. <laughs> it's a winepress. It's... I don't, do you know what a wine press is? I mean, it's where they put the grapes in there and they got a stomp on it to, to crush it. They, they, we're talking about humanity. That's right. We're talking about the judgment of humanity. People, people forget the judgment side of God. Lord, help us. This should provoke our hearts to want to see people saved. And even if, even if we don't feel a call, to be active evangelists at this point in our walk. And I get that. That's, that's, a, that's another step, right? But I've seen people that I would have never thought that are already talking about Jesus at work, talking about Jesus to people that they know on the side. That's evangelism, my friend. Amen. That is so powerful. And I'm so grateful to see that kind of thing happen. But even if, we're, even if we haven't done that yet... Lord, stir our hearts to where we will at least begin to pray that your spirit would be released upon this earth in a way like never before. Lord, as we see the darkness upon the earth, please allow your spirit to, be, to move in a way like never before. Please cause our lights to shine brighter in the midst of darkness. That those, because you never know who's going to respond to the seed of the gospel. You never know who, when you plant that seed, that it's going to take root and that it's going to bring forth life you don't know it's not your job to figure it out it's not my job to figure it out it's just our job to just to pray and to and to speak the truth praise God so the Hebrews passage tells us that the sword of God's word discerns thoughts and tents it reveals the motives of the heart the word of God is a piercing light amen and, and it shows it to the interior and it gets into the dark corners of our hearts and it says to those that belong to him now what are we going to do with this Amen. You've been there before when you're in the word of God and the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. Amen. And it, it pinpoints that thing. And I don't know about you, man. John put a, a message from Brother Larson on uh, on text group yesterday. And uh, I tell you what, man, it was it, it was it was powerful. Amen. And I'm, I'm, the point that I'm trying to make right now, though, is, is that is that the light comes in and it shines into the dark corners of our hearts and then it reveals to us. See, the word of God desires to reveal to us so that he can do the work in us. So that when we partner with the Holy Spirit and we recognize what's going on in us, amen, that the Lord will begin to do the work, amen. He'll begin to change us. That's how the word of God works. That's how the cross works. I want you to know that. The, the way the cross works is, is that Jesus already defeated the powers of darkness. That's what the word of God teaches. The, the powers of darkness are already defeated. The question is, do you believe that? The question is, do I believe that? The, power, the powers of darkness have no control over your mind. They, they don't. They, they really don't. 
Because see, the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit through what Jesus has already done can give us victory. Has all, no, let me say it like this. Has already given us victory over our mind. Has already given us victory in our soulless man. Has already given us victory. We just have to line up and believe what God's word says. We have to understand and believe that God has already done the work and that he's already our victorious warrior. But that's what he does though. The word of God, the spirit of God, the sword of the Lord will, will move in and begin to reveal to us and then he'll say to those that belong to him what are we going to do with this amen and sometimes it's not even gross sin sometimes it's unbelief sometimes it's belief or faith in something other than the lord right that's where i was going to get at in that message many times he's chipping away at the old man what, what did your old man look like you just fill in the blank i see some people like dude you don't want to know all right and I mean, everybody's old man looked different. And we've all had our own struggles. My old man looked pretty ugly at times. Really, really ugly. Okay, and you know how long, though, after he set me free from, once he set me free from sneaking another drink of alcohol in the backyard, even though I was going to church or whatever, you get the point. I was still struggling with things that I felt convicted about. Once all that stuff was gone, oh my gosh, we had a mess there that I had never seen before. And he's still cleaning it up. You understand what I'm getting at? Like, there was some mess up in my heart. Attitudes. Yep. Mindsets. Yep. Pride. Arrogance. All I can tell you is, you may not be seeing enough change in me, I don't know. But I can promise you, I'm crying out, oh, Lord, change me. Change me. I want to be, I want to be changed. But a lot of times, whenever those other things are in the way, he can't even. That, but now he's really wanting to. He's really wanting to do a work on the inside of us. Amen. Anything that's going to hinder his will on this earth and hinder him working in the lives of other people. I was going to read a little bit more of the Corinthian passage, but this was the part I wanted to bring you to. Verse eleven. It says this: "And such were some of you, <laughs> but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified." In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You've been washed. The word it washed is apo luo. Apo means to pull away. Luo means to wash. It means literal, a literal, most literal translation would be a way wash. <laughs> but it means to, to wash away. He, he washed away our sins as far as the east is from the west. And that's part of justification. Believing that. Believing, see, how many people, you don't have to raise your hand, but just how many people, sometimes you walk around under a cloud of guilt and condemnation. The enemy tries to follow you, right? And he tries to suppress you and oppress you with a cloud of heaviness and guilt. I'm here to tell you right now that that is not God's will for your life. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus, when he died on the cross, has already done the work to free you from that. Thank you. But you got to know it first off, and then you got to believe it. And as you believe it, he's going to reveal it to you. Right. And you're going to begin to feel that cloud lift off of you. See, the washing away of the sin from the blood of Jesus allows the Holy Spirit to say this over your life. You're justified. The word justified means that you, in the mind of God, have been declared righteous. Let me say that again. The word justified means that you in the mind of God have been declared righteous. And then listen to me. The front end of this thing is important. It's not based upon the fact that you're doing everything right. right. We're talking about the righteousness of Jesus yeah, right. that you've been clothed with. The Bible teaches that if you've been born again, according to Galatians 3 and 27, that you have clothed yourself with Jesus. That you've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And whenever you learn to rest in that. And see, see, the enemy doesn't want you to get a revelation of this. And only the Holy Spirit can give you a revelation of this. I can say it to you, but Holy Spirit, I pray that you give a revelation to your people. That they would be able to walk in this truth because it will set you free. That whenever you begin to believe that and you don't believe the words of the devil. When you feel that cloud of oppression or depression, that dark cloud try to rest upon you. And you say, no, you're a lying devil. The word of God says I'm justified. The word of God 
God says I'm made righteous, not because of my acts of righteousness, but because of his righteousness that was that was t taken from me on the cross. Amen. When he died in my place and now the great exchange took place. He took my sin. Amen. And I was given his righteousness. I've been justified. Praise God. I am free because the father has declared me righteous because I have put. See, really what you're doing is. You're, you're all you're really what you're doing is I'm saying all you're doing, but it's really huge. Really, what you're doing is you're agreeing with God. That's it. And I, listen, when I'm saying agreeing with God, it's really a big deal. It's a simple thought, but it's really, 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 really big. Well, what do you mean? Well, here we go. <laughs> Hallelujah. The world is dead and full of sin, but yet God, after the flood, calls a man named Abraham and says, Hey, hey, come out of your father's house. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and through your seed in thee, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And he said, I'm going to give you a land for your people. You're not even going to see it, Abraham, but I'm going to give you a land. And he gives him this little tiny seed liver over there in the Middle East and from that one spot the seed of Abraham is Jesus that was planted on this earth hallelujah and Jesus died on the cross and here we are that Jesus died he ascended and the Holy Spirit came down Jesus said it is expedient that I go away for if I do not go he will not come but if I go he comes hallelujah and he is the helper he is the comforter he is the teacher and whenever you agree with God. That's a big deal, my friend. Before the foundation of the earth, God had a plan for you. It was a land that was slain before the foundation of the earth. And he saw you in him. And all you're doing now is agreeing with him and what he says about you. If you are born again this morning, you are not guilty. The enemy is lying to you. And you are allowed. Don't let the enemy lie to you. You lying devil. We take authority over your lives in the name of Jesus. We receive the truth. The engrafted truth of God's word. It's washing our minds. It's healing our hearts. The truth of God's word will heal us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified by the spirit of our God. Hallelujah. And he works through what Jesus did. The finished work of Christ allows you to be clothed in his righteousness. And because you're clothed in his righteousness, the Holy Spirit now has access to flow, to flow into you, to heal you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So that's one edge of the sword, conviction. And then there's the restoration or the setting free side, right? The Holy Spirit has that sword and is the word of the Lord. Amen. And the power of the Spirit's sword works directly through its truth. Both ways. Conviction and setting free. It's when people embrace the truth of God's word that they get set free. That's simple. No, it's that simple. It doesn't get any easier than that. That's the simplicity of the gospel that people talk about. You believe what he says, and then it goes to work. Amen? But when people allow the truth of God's word to have its way with them, then freedom comes. You know why? You know why freedom comes? Because Jesus said so. <laughs> That's right. Look at, look at John chapter 8, verse, verses 31 through 32. John 8, 31 through 32. I want, you to, I want you to see this. So Jesus is talking to these Jewish people. These, you know, probably some leaders involved in here. But, you know, Jews were, were an interesting bunch. As time went forward, man, you think Christians are bad. You ever met Christians? Have you ever been to churches before where, where Christians are so, like, full of themselves and so such a religious spirit that yes. they look down on you. Yeah, I mean, dude, I've been to churches like that before. And the Lord, if I've ever done that to somebody, please forgive me because I'm telling you, that is the most uncomfortable feeling when you're around a person and they just, they just, you can tell they think they're so much better than you. But that's how the Jewish mind was. 
by the time Jesus shows up, right? He says, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. So these guys were saying that now you're here. We believe you're the one. All right. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Praise God. Now, now there's a whole lot to that truth. And basically everything that I just said when I got excited a little while ago is that truth. The, that, uh, the truth of what he came to do. Amen? Amen. But then look what it says right here. In John, see, Because you see, you got the conviction part, then you got the setting free part. But in order for the setting free part to take place, you got to believe it. And then you got to respond to it. You got to repent. But look what they said in verse 33. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed. Now, 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 do you understand what this, what's going on here? The Jewish mind is so full of pride. You know, they're like, we, we are the descendants of Abraham. Like they would look at you and I as, they still do today. Not, not you know, not Rabbi Ron, praise God. But, but I've tried to talk to a Jewish man one time. I just remember it just, it went into my mind. I was at, me and Danielle were in the French Quarter, walked into a store. And he was reading something, and I could tell it was a religious book. I'm like, what are you reading? The Hebrew Torah. And I'm like, and he was an old guy. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. And I started trying to talk to him about <laughs> stuff having to do with the Old Testament. And he just looked at me like, I know what he was thinking. There's a word in the Hebrew. It's called goyim, you little piece of cattle. What are you doing approaching me about this holy book? Okay, and that's, I'm telling you, I could feel, and I was like, oh, there ain't no conversation going on here today, right? And, and so, but, but that's what they think about themselves. Not, not all of them. I'm just trying to make a point. That's the religious mindset. There's a spirit connected to a religious mindset. You got to understand that. You got to be careful. You don't want to, you don't want to allow yourself to be caught up with a religious spirit. It's not good to have a religious spirit. I know I've been there. It's not a good thing. We want to be humble. We want to be teachable. We want to, we want to be a, have a contrite heart. Amen. So he says, we be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? So they're not allowing the sword to have its way in their lives. The conviction of truth should follow with repentance. You know, the book of Acts says this, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That comes out of Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Let me read that one more time. Repent ye therefore. And you know the word repent is used like 22 times in the New Testament. And repentance is used like 25 times. 57 times the word repent, repentance is used. It's pretty important because, it, because see, it, it's, it's really the key that connects the cross to your heart. Yes, you you got you to gotta agree good. with God's word. Yeah. And that's what really repentance means. It means to come into agreement with God's word. Not your own way of thinking. Yeah. Not Twitter. Not Facebook. Not YouTube or whatever. Not Hollywood. Not the music industry. No. The word of the living God. Where your mind comes into agreement with the word of God. And whenever that happens, it says your sins will be blotted out. And then times of refreshing. Now, I looked up that word this morning of refreshing, and the word is anaphyxis. Now, does that sound like a similar English word? If you were going to anaphyxis, does anybody come up with a fancy word? Yeah, yes, thank you, sir. Asphyxiate. That's really, it means to remove the asphyxiation. It's like you couldn't breathe. You ever, you, that's what the word is, asphyx, to be asphyxiated means. It's like you can't breathe. It's like your breath is being taken away from you. But the refreshing that comes when you yield to the truth of God's word, it moves that asphyxiation away. Oh, it removes so and there comes yes. refreshing. Yes. I can breathe. Yes. I can breathe. Yes. I can breathe again. Hallelujah. I've been reconnected to the life of God. Yes. Praise God. And listen, you got to learn how to live your life that way. Yes. And now you're just entering in the first time you respond, but you got to learn how to live your life that way because the enemy is going to keep trying to pile it on you, keep trying to steal your breath, keep trying to steal the spirit of God out of you. So these religious Jews, though, they weren't allowing the word of God to have its way. And so therefore they can't be healed. Let's go back and look at that verse one more time. John 8 and 33. It says, they answered him, 
We be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage. But this is good right here. I'm telling you right now, this is good. You may not, you may not, you, I might have lost you a long time ago, but this is good. All right, you ready? They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free. And, and that's the same spirit that's in a lot of Christian lives. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, yeah. I'm free. I don't, I love, I forgive, I've forgiven. Listen, I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. I'm okay. I'm sorry, but what they just said right there is nothing but a bold-faced lie. That's right. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to get too nasty or mean, but that is a lie. What are you talking about? That Abraham's seed has never been in bondage to any man. Do you not remember the days of Egypt when you were slaves to Pharaoh? Do you not remember that you had to go get your own straw and keep up with the quota of bricks? Do you not remember how the Assyrians under Nebuchadnezzar came in there and destroyed the upper ten northern tribes? Do you not remember Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar that came through and ravaged Jerusalem and took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and brought them back to Babylon? Do you not remember Persia and how Persia came in and how Daniel had to go live over there amongst and then King Cyrus let him go? Do you not remember Alexander the Great and how Alexander the Great came through and offered up a pig on your altar, man? You still celebrate Hanukkah, I believe it is, or the Festival of Lights every year to remember how the Maccabees gave you victory, but they put a pig on your altar. Do you not remember where you are right now? Come on. Come on. You're under Roman rule. Yes. You're a slave right now. Caesar's all over your coinage. Jesus said, pay the Caesar what belongs to him. You are a slave to the Roman Empire. What are you talking about? You never been. My Lord. Lord, help us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Help us. Listen, I'm closing with this concept here. I don't know how long he's going to take me. But... <laughs> I was thinking about the parables of the kingdom. I love to teach the parables. Each parable has so much revelation. In my mind, you know, scholars might would say that I'm doing it wrong, but in my mind, almost every single detail, it just opens up so much truth to me. But this morning I was thinking, there's no way you could teach one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten parables in the next ten minutes, right? <laughs> one minute per parable. But when I started looking at it as a whole, man, it was just it was just so profound, it was so powerful. To see the kingdom of God, because that's what these parables I'm talking about are. The kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like. Right? And when you take them all together, and just take like a little sentence or so, and you start stringing them together, it's like, wow. Lord, help. Help us, your people, to communicate your truth to this lost and dying world, Lord God. But in the first parable of the sower, you know, what did he say? He said that some of the seed fell along the wayside, right? Some of the seed fell among stony, thorn, stony ground. Some of the seed fell amongst the thorns. And when it's all said and done, not to interpret each one of those things, but to just say this, as I've studied these parables, I've realized how hostile this word, world is to the seed of God's word. Right? This world is so hostile. It says the fowl of the air came. It tells us what that was. That was Satan and his angels coming to steal the seed of the word, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The enemy wants to steal the word of God out of your heart. Yes. And then it goes on into the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, different obstacles that would try to prevent the, the root from getting down where it can draw up. The, you know what, you get what I'm saying? What I want you to get out of that is this, though, is that the world that we live in is hostile to the seed of God's word. And then right after that, we get the parable of the tares and the wheat. And, we, and we're told that a good man sows seed in his field, 
which was the word of God, and that an enemy came in whenever the men slept. So the men that were supposed to take care of the field fell asleep. And many times I can't help but think now, granted, he was probably talking directly about Israel falling asleep on the watch and that another nation would come later. But do you think the church ain't never fell asleep? I think we got a pretty good type with Peter in the garden. Right. And so when, when the men fell asleep and the enemy came and he sowed different kinds of seeds amongst the wheat and that the seeds that he sowed were tares. And people argue over this, but there was a certain type of a weed called a Darnell plant that looked almost exactly like wheat. And it wasn't until the very end near harvest that you could even distinguish between the two and that that weed plant was actually poisonous, people would say. And so Jesus said, don't you, try to, don't you try to pull them up. He said, what's going to happen is, is this. You just leave it to me. Because in the end of the age, I'm going to separate them out. Yes. I'm going to take bundles of those tares, and they're going to be burnt up. But the wheat, that which was genuine, yeah. that which really belonged to me, that wheat is going to be brought into the storehouse. He was talking about it will enter into the kingdom of God. But then you got the mustard tree. I mean, the seed of a mustard tree, that's why he used the seed of a mustard to do it, because it was the smallest of seeds. But, but he said that the seed of a mustard tree, I was reading in some commentaries, one old boy said that he saw a mustard tree as tall as 12 foot. Now that's kind of a, that's a big, because most of them were like plants. But some of these mustard trees would grow to as tall as 12 feet and it'd have, you know, one inch, two inch branches where the fowl of the air could live within it. But the point is this, is that the seed looks so insignificant. But then whenever it begins to produce what it's producing. And then the leaven, there was the parable of the leaven. You know what leaven is? It's, any, any of y'all in here bake? Yeah, y'all bake. You know, so leaven is yeast. Okay. So leaven is yeast. And you know what happens is this. So yeast is, yeast is an organism. It's alive. And you put a pinch of yeast into a batch of dough. And what does it do? It takes over. Yeah, it rises. It, listen, it takes over and it changes the nature of the dough. See, the kingdom of God is like a little leaven in a batch of dough. Whenever you put the pinch in there, it starts to spread. And it looks like it was so insignificant like that little mustard seed. But then the next thing you know, it grows. And the next thing you know, it begins to spread. And it did exactly what Jesus said it was going to do. The kingdom of God today has spread throughout the earth. And there's so many people that are like us that have the life of God on the inside of us. It did exactly what Jesus said yes. it was going to do. And then the kingdom of God is like a treasure in a field that a man found the treasure. And you know, sometimes these parables break down a little bit, but look, it's kind of like he's like, not that Kleenex box will be a treasure, but he's like, he's in this field and he just happens upon, listen, instead of a Kleenex box, let's use this. He finds a treasure and he's like, make sure nobody's looking let me go ahead and hide that and let me go sell my stuff and let me buy that field because <laughs> i got to have that treasure. Yes, yes. Because that treasure is the most important thing ever. He that's going to follow after me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross. Yes. If his mother or his father mm -hmm. take it away, then you're not worthy of me. Mm -hmm. Brother, sister, mother-in-law, his daughter-in-law. <laughs> the scripture says. All right. So that's the most, the pearl of great promise. There was a merchant that was sailing the seas looking for that pearl. And when he found that one goodly pearl, he sold everything for that one pearl. What is it in life? And listen to me. I mean, I'm speaking to myself. What is it in life? What dreams, what aspirations, what desires prevent us from selling out to God? Listen, sometimes some of you might say, yeah, but I have a desire to be a doctor. Okay, well, praise God. If your desire lines up with God's will, hallelujah, it'll be a beautiful thing. But if your desire supersedes God's will for your life, it's not good at all. All right? So, so I'm trying to say, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that there's a, that the so that the world is hostile to the seed of God's word. I'm trying to say that in the midst 
of the sowing of the seed, there will also be those that look like wheat, but they're not really wheat. Uh, I'm also trying to say that even though the gospel and the kingdom seems insignificant to people, it's growing and it's spread, amen, and it's affecting the earth. So much so that I'm telling you, the spirit of Antichrist is angry right now. The spirit of Antichrist is angry right now. We're on the cusp. I believe that. I'm not trying to be a negative preacher, but I believe with all of my heart, we are on the cusp of starting to really see some persecution on the church. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the kingdom of God is more precious than is, is like that treasure in the field. It's like that pearl of great pride. And in the end, though, see, there's people that are not going to be willing to receive it. And in the end, it's going to be like the parable of the net with the fish. Where he's going to gather up all those fish and he's going to bring them on shore and then he's going to start sorting between them. Good fish, bad fish. Good fish, bad fish. It's like the, it's like the parable of the goats and the sheep. It, the word nations is used, but the Greek word is actually ethnos, the ethnicities of the world. He saved, he redeemed us with his blood from every tongue, tribe, nation, from every kindred. He is going to separate the ethnicities of the world. Those that were with him will go to the right with the sheep. Those that were against him are the goats. They'll go, they'll go to the left. It's like the parable of the virgins. That there were people that were in that thought they were in. But that when the time came, they weren't really prepared to endure until the end. They didn't have what they really needed. They thought they were okay. They thought that they were in, but they weren't really prepared. They weren't really filled with the oil of the presence that they needed. They weren't really uh, submitting themselves to the truth of God's word. And because of that, they, whenever the time came, the door was closed. Right. And they're knocking and they're trying to get in. He's like, I didn't know you. It's like the parable of the man that had a wedding for his son. He said, go out into the highways and the byways. Tell them that they're invited. Yes, yes. Oh, he's so good. Aren't you glad that you got invited yes. to the wedding? Yes. Come on, somebody. Help me out. I'll, ne I'll never forget. He invited me so many times. Mm. And finally, uh -huh. finally, My gosh. I said yes. yes. <laughs> he's so good. He's so merciful and long-suffering. Don't give up on your loved ones. Right. Pray for them. Seek God for them. Yes. Yes. Amen. The Holy Spirit will draw them in. Jesus. You know? Jesus. He said, tell them they're invited. You know, they said, man, I got stuff I'm going to do. You know, I just bought a field. You know, when you have a field, you got to plow it. And um, I got some business I got to take care of. Got a little commerce exchange going on over here. And, and really and truly, if we're honest with one another, there's been times in our own lives that we have definitely been that way. I mean, I'm not talking about just coming to church. I'm talking about living for the Lord. That, you know what I'm saying? Let's separate the two. I mean, yeah, people that live for the Lord, they go to church, but let's not turn it into some law that it's not intended to be. It's to serve God with your heart, with everything that's in you, the way he served you. He searched you by laying his life down. And I realize we're all at different places, but that's really where he desires us to get to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, in that scripture, in that teaching yesterday on, in the text, it, it says, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, Sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You know, the Lord wants to make us vessels of honor. There's a process that takes place where we agree with the Holy Spirit, singers, musicians, y'all can come, where we agree with the Holy Spirit, where we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way and the process begins the work of changing us on the inside. One last scripture I want to give you before we go to the Lord in prayer before we allow some time for us to just be alone and share our heart with the Lord. Amen? Um, it is out of Ephesians chapter 1 verses 6 through 7. If you could put that up there. This, this word just came to my heart last night when I was thinking about this message. It says, 
to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. <laughs> you're accepted this morning. Yeah. You need to know that if your faith is in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross, I want to just encourage you to know that you're accepted. And if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, let's just start right now. You can either come to the altar and we'll pray with you, or you can do it right there in your chair. And you can call out and you can say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Yes. I want him in my heart. I want to ask forgiveness of my sin. But you got to do that. You have to yield to him. And he goes on to say, look at this. It's in verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He's already done it, church. He's already made the way for us to have a relationship with him. Right, man? For us, listen, you are accepted in the beloved. I want you leaving out of this place this morning to know this. If you've put your faith in God's plan, if you've put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross, and you've accepted him, amen, and you've, said, and you've asked forgiveness of your sin, you are accepted in the beloved. Don't you let that devil lie to you when you walk out of here. Don't you let him weigh you down with a bunch of lies and try to condemn you and try to put a cloud of guilt on you. I'm here to tell you this morning, you are accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.